Welcome to Diagnosing Healthcare, a podcast featuring thought-provoking conversations about the latest legal, policy, and regulatory issues in healthcare. While these issues may seem like hurdles, we'll also look at the business opportunities and solutions that exist. Diagnosing Healthcare is brought to you by the healthcare lawyers at Epstein Becker Green, a leading law firm that has more than 40 years experience serving clients in the healthcare industry nationwide. Today on Diagnosing Healthcare, we will discuss actions taken under the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, or the PREP Act, that provided the avenue for pharmacists and pharmacies to play a major role in the response to COVID-19. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Kayla Schenkel. I'm an attorney in Epstein, Becker & Green's healthcare and life sciences practice based out of our Washington, D.C. office. For years, pharmacy advocates have urged policymakers to make changes to state scope of practice laws that would permit pharmacists to prescribe and administer certain tests and vaccines at the pharmacy. As the coronavirus hit America in March 2020, these efforts accelerated when the federal government leveraged authority under the PREP Act to unleash pharmacists to provide tests and vaccines despite state scope of practice limitations. On today's show, we're going to discuss the history of pharmacists' scope of practice before the pandemic and how COVID-19 response efforts utilized a declaration under the PREP Act to release pharmacists as testers and vaccinators for the country. If you like what you hear today, please subscribe to the show. Diagnosing Healthcare is available wherever you get your podcast. And for more detail on today's topic, please check out an article authored by Richard Hughes and myself coming out soon. Information on the article will be linked in the notes of this podcast. Joining our discussion today is Richard Hughes. Richard is a partner at EBG in our DC office. Much of Richard's practice focuses on vaccine strategy and regulatory counseling for biopharmaceutical companies. Richard has served as an executive at a major healthcare consulting firm and was head of policy at Moderna during the COVID-19 pandemic. Richard, welcome. Thank you. Also joining our discussion is Will Chang. Will was Deputy General Counsel at the Department of Health and Human Services for Public Health, Litigation, Investigations, and the 340B Drug Pricing Program. Will was one of the lead attorneys supporting Operation Warp Speed, working with public and private partners to build a nationwide distribution and administration solutions for COVID-19 vaccines. Will worked closely with the Deputy Secretary, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the HHS Office of the Inspector General, and the U.S. Department of Justice to reform the anti-kickback statute and Stark Law to facilitate value-based care. And now, Will is the Executive Vice President, Chief Legal Officer, and Corporate Secretary at Upstream. Will, welcome. Thank you, Kayla. And it's good to be chatting with you again. To start, I want to take a brief jog down memory lane. It's March 2020, and the world has begun to realize that the coronavirus a highly contagious and deadly virus, is a major concern. People will likely remember that one of the first big news stories was, how do people even get access to tests to figure out how they have COVID-19? There were images of long car lines outside stadiums just to get tested. Everyone was trying to find a test, but that easy access was not available. Richard, during this time, I kept thinking to myself, why can't I just go to my local pharmacy and get tested? Pharmacists could handle this. What was preventing Americans from doing just that? Sure, Kayla. So I think that's logical. And of course, that's before we had the widespread availability of at-home testing. And the answer to your question is because the states are actually the regulators of the health professions and the regulators of pharmacist scope of practice. And states are highly varied in their approach to what they actually allow pharmacists to do in their practice. So states determine what pharmacists can actually do in terms of assessing a patient, as well as whether they can administer or prescribe tests or certain drugs or vaccines. At the time, in April of 2020, there really was a patchwork of the state scope of practice laws that would have prohibited a pharmacist from administering a point of care test in the pharmacy. And so what happened was the federal government stepped in and through an EUA declaration, essentially preempted state law, allowing pharmacists to administer these tests. So Richard just talked about the scope of practice for pharmacists. What is a scope of practice exactly? Yeah. So scope of practice, you know, defines what a medical professional can do, what medical services, what medical items can be ordered, prescribed, administered to which age group in a particular state. So that's the what part. You know, you mentioned earlier the jog down memory lane in March 2020. This one is going to be burned as my memory forever because I still remember 
March 13th, 2020, sitting at HHS watching the news conference from the Rose Garden with the president and the CEOs of large companies announcing the community-based testing sites program to try to meet the gap that both you and Richard have talked about, right? Creating testing sites, many of them would be pharmacy-based with drive-through testing options in some of our most vulnerable and hard hit communities so that folks can have access into all too scarce COVID-19 tests at the time. And so that was a question we faced. First, how do we address all these state scope of practice restrictions? Because like Richard said, it is a patchwork. And second, once you can do it, how do you pay for it? So this program was launched with those two obstacles in mind. And Richard, even though ordering and administering tests and vaccines might not be in a pharmacist's scope of practice, many schools actually train their students to provide these clinical services. That's a really good thing because this pandemic can't be the first emergency response effort that the nation's really needed pharmacists to help accelerate access to care. Are there any previous examples of barriers that have prevented pharmacists from practicing at the top of their license? And um, how has scope of practice changed over time? Yeah, so this really is something, Caleb, that has evolved over time. And as we think about professional scope of practice, which is what is actually within a pharmacist's capability as they're they're trained, you know, legal scope of practice takes a while to catch up because we have to wait on the states to uh, enact changes that that expand pharmacist scope of practice to catch up to professional scope of practice. I think we also have drivers like reimbursement that can encourage expansion of pharmacist scope of practice. So for example, in the early uh, 1990s, CMS allowed uh, roster billing under Medicare Part B. So otherwise pharmacists would not be able to bill services under Medicare Part B because they're not recognized providers today under Medicare Part B. Uh, But roster billing facilitated their ability to bill for certain vaccines. And then what we saw in the early 2000s was uh, the creation of the Part D prescription drug benefit and the coverage of vaccines not covered under Part B covered under Part D, which meant that pharmacists really would have to play a critical role in administering those vaccines. So as we saw new adult vaccines launched in the early 2000s, we saw efforts to go out and start to expand pharmacists' scope of practice so that they could administer those vaccines. And then we saw a real catalyst with the H1N1 influenza pandemic. So that really, I think, caused states to realize that pharmacists were critical vaccinators. We saw a lot of action, legislative action and uh, governors issuing executive orders to allow pharmacists to administer flu vaccines more broadly to populations in their states. And again, that was really a catalyst for further expansion of pharmacists' scope of practice. Prior to this pandemic, we saw a lot of efforts toward that end, but still to this day, state law, as well as said, as you've said, it's still very much a patchwork. So it sounds like the patchwork of state actions for COVID-19 needed some help and the federal government had an idea. But to understand this idea, I need to explain that at the start of the pandemic, the Secretary of Health and Human Services had issued a declaration under the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act the PrEP Act, which provided immunity from liability for certain persons and entities that engage in activities that advance the COVID-19 response. For example, if a practitioner provided a COVID-19 vaccine to a person and that person had an adverse reaction to the vaccine, the PrEP Act declaration would provide immunity for that practitioner, meaning the injured person would not be able to sue the practitioner for his injuries. But this immunity only works if the practitioner, the product, or the action is specifically covered under the declaration issued under the PREP Act. So Richard, why would Congress pass a federal law like this? Yeah, so Kayla, what Congress is attempting to do here in passing laws like the PREP Act is to ensure that when we're in a pandemic situation, that providers feel like they can immediately respond, that manufacturers are incentivized to research, develop, and manufacture pandemic countermeasures, and that the entire supply chain is immune from liability so that we can get those countermeasures, whether that's vaccines or therapeutics, as quickly as possible through the supply chain and delivered to the patient by the provider. Essentially, it does provide uh, a shield from liability, but there is a mechanism through the countermeasures injury compensation program that allows a patient, if they do have a recognized injury as a result of administration of a countermeasure, 
they can bring their claim under the CICP and receive damages. There is an exception to that program. So if there's an example of, say, willful misconduct on the part of a provider, then the patient would have their typical tort remedies where they would be able to sue in state court. During a pandemic, we deal with situations where literally the science often changes on a day-to-day basis. So there is a very uncertain environment. Also, many of those stakeholders that you just mentioned, providers, distributors, manufacturers, and all those others who as a nation, as a world, we need to jump in before the science is settled to take risks, to work hand in glove with public health authorities to respond to the pandemic are often doing so at the direction of the government. So it boils down to a really simple principle. If you want folks to help you and to do what you tell them to do and you're the government in a very unsettled environment and want them to take these risks, in order for that to be successful, the government has to take steps to mitigate those risks on behalf of those patriots who are willing to step up. That's right. Well, it sounds like the PrEP Act is basically a law that provides immunity from liability. But the federal government used the PREP Act in a very different way during this pandemic. Indeed, several times throughout the pandemic, HHS amended the PREP Act declaration to provide an avenue for pharmacists to order and administer COVID-19 tests, vaccines, and other actions. How did HHS do this? And what was the impact of such action? To get a better understanding of this process, I'm going to take a step back about a month or two to uh, 2019, November, to explain how pharmacists really began partnering with the federal government on a nationwide scale to deal with a public health crisis. And this is HIV. In November of 2019, HHS launched the nation's first 50-state all-territory drug distribution program using the pharmaceutical donation by Gilead. This is their pill that is a pre-exposure prophylaxis that when used properly can be highly, highly effective in preventing the sexual transmission of HIV. But the public health experts at HHS realize in order to reach those populations, particularly those in rural communities and other underserved communities, they would need to partner with pharmacies and in particular, independent community pharmacies. The nation's pharmacies stood up, tens of thousands of pharmacies donated their dispensing services, their counseling services, their mail order services to support that program. So that infrastructure was already in place, working with a hub, working with a drug distribution company to reach patients all across the nation. But even back then, folks were looking at the second issue of how. Already with pre-exposure prophylaxis, California was going to expand what pharmacists could do in terms of prescribing and uh, ordering this drug for patients who were in the at-risk population and were on the FDA indication for this drug. Similarly, Colorado was in the queue for that as well. So this issue was already front of mind. When COVID came up and we were looking at, when HHS was looking at the patchwork, that was obviously going to be a barrier in ready access to not just the testing, but looking forward to therapeutic and vaccines. Folks are thinking, going back to the Public Health Service Act, really scouring every available law and regular authority out there to what could possibly preempt state scope of practice rules. Because recall, this has not been done before. And it's not been done before for a good reason. There were no laws actually designed with that particular purpose in mind because American healthcare was designed to be primarily local. The states would define the scope of practice. And looking at the PrEP Act, the Office of General Counsel at HHS noticed that there were certain preemption provisions that says anything in the secretary's declaration or a requirement for immunity under the PrEP Act that is different from or in conflict with state law would preempt that state law. That posed an interesting possibility. Well, how do you take that? Well, there was another provision in PrEP Act that allowed, to your point earlier, for the secretary to designate exactly who would receive such liability protections. And there was an interesting provision that identified two categories of health professionals. The first category was those who were authorized under state law to perform the activity that would receive the liability protection. And then the second category would be any other category of persons that the secretary deem should receive protection. 
So when we looked at that, we concluded that if Congress wrote that there was a second category that is different from those who are authorized under state law, then logically the secretary can designate those who are not authorized under state law to do something to receive liability protection when that individual engages in that service, whether it be administering vaccines or ordering tests. And then you tie it to the language on preemption, then we have the secretary able to designate conditions under which an individual could practice outside of their state scope of practice and that would receive preemption. And here's the extra kicker. The statute as written said that anything the secretary designates in the secretary's declaration of the PrEP Act would not be challengeable in any federal or state court because Congress essentially stripped any court in the United States a jurisdiction to hear challenges to the Secretary's declaration. So with that, we're off to races on preempting state scope of practice rules to help our nation respond as a whole to the COVID pandemic. I remember early on when the first advisory opinion from the HHS General Counsel's office came out and, you know, putting together a flow chart of, okay, I think this works. And they're probably in following that exact you know, what you just laid out there is, I think this is what they're doing. But once the advisory opinion came out, it became very crystal clear. But (laughs) there were some states that took some time and some other actors took some time to understand that message. So what actions did the federal government take to, to drive that message of preemption? Absolutely. I mean, look, it was very encouraging. Shortly after the advisory opinion that first laid out that legal framework, HHS saw a number of states immediately follow on and issue similar scope of practice expansions to mirror what HHS was doing under the PrEP Act. There was resistance from some other places, including uh, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, And this is probably the first time that a PrEP Act was ever in the New York Times, but Nevada took (laughs) issue with the position that HHS took. But at the end of each of those engagements, there was actually no lawsuits against HHS in those territories in Nevada ended up acquiescing to the position of the federal government. And rightly so, I think it's a reflection of the soundness of that legal analysis. HHS also took very proactive steps to really get ahead of any concerns because the traditional concern with expanding pharmacist scope of practice, or in fact, any other scope of practice, is there are going to be some who sees these expansions as a zero-sum game. If pharmacists can do more than other professionals who can already do that thing, whether it's administering child vaccinations, whether it's ordering and administering COVID tests, might have less patients to see. And so HHS really stepped up and made clear that everyone can win in this scenario. And I'll give you an example that really highlights that. When it came to authorizing pharmacists to help reverse the troubling decrease in childhood vaccinations that we as a nation saw during the COVID pandemic, One of the requirements that the secretary put into the PrEP Act declaration amendment that authorized pharmacists to administer child vaccinations to certain children is that those pharmacists must assist the children or their caregivers with wild child visits, including referrals where appropriate, right? We took that model. It wasn't an original model that HE just came up with. That model is already in place and the Public Health Service Corps had already used similar models in Native American territories, which at the end of the day saw both an uptick in child vaccination rates, which is fantastic, and more children making the wild child visits and being part of a medical home. So it really goes back to that notion that when the patient wins, all the healthcare professionals can win together. So I think the message really was driven on preemption there. Once pharmacists could order and administer tests and vaccines, the COVID-19 response effort really took off at pharmacy retail locations, both big and small. Indeed, uh, the CDC recently reported that as of July 7th, 2022, more than 258.1 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been administered and reported by the federal retail pharmacy program in the U.S., Richard, the federal government seems to continue to rely on pharmacists to bolster the COVID-19 response efforts. 
most recently with its authorization to permit pharmacists to prescribe Paxlovid under certain circumstances. Do you think pharmacist scope of practice will continue to expand? Yes, Kayla, I do. And I think this uh, Paxlovid EUA expansion is going to be a catalyst, just like the PrEP Act declaration is going to be a catalyst for pharmacist scope of practice. So, you know, I know we've, we've checked into this, but I think that this is potentially unprecedented in terms of the FDA specifying, not within a label in this case, but with an, an emergency use authorization, specifying which provider type can uh, administer a therapeutic or drug. In this case, the FDA specifically referenced pharmacists and their ability to prescribe Paxlovid. Now, what's interesting is they do actually have to assess certain patients for renal or liver function, uh, potential drug interactions. So this requires them to perform a patient assessment, essentially. Now that pharmacists have received this authorization, we're going to have to get past a, a reimbursement hurdle. Uh, pharmacists do not currently have a way to bill Medicare for this clinical assessment and counseling that they have to do with patients because, as I mentioned earlier, they're not recognized providers under the Medicare Part B statute. So CMS, as I understand it, is working on a mechanism so that pharmacists can bill Medicare for these activities. So that'll be something to watch. And then to your question about further expansion of state scope of practice laws, as well, very well described, the PREP Act declaration for expanding pharmacist uh, scope of practice and preempting state law, that will end and we will need states, if we are to see pharmacists continue to play an expanded role, states will need to actually change their laws so that that is possible. And as well said, before the pandemic, we saw pharmacists authorized under state law in California to dispense PrEP for HIV. Uh, we've increasingly seen pharmacists authorized to prescribe and dispense uh, contraceptives. I think we're really going to see continued efforts at the state level to expand pharmacists' ability to vaccinate or to prescribe and administer certain products. You know, Richard, that's actually a really good point. When HHS was looking at trends of state scope of practice laws, particularly when it came to childhood vaccinations, the trend goes one way. More and more states, as time goes along, not only authorize pharmacists to administer childhood vaccinations, but more and more states authorize pharmacists to administer and order child vaccinations to a wider array of disease states into younger and younger ages. So the trending is in the right direction. And I have every reason to believe that the same will be true in other disease states, because at the end of the day, it's good for public health, which is also good for public and private fisc. So, well, Richard brings up a really good point. The PrEP Act declaration and the authorities under it, it's going to eventually expire. Do you have any thoughts on when that might occur? And really what's next for pharmacists and pharmacies that have built such robust testing and vaccination programs? What are they going to do when it all expires? You know, that's a great question. So I'll, I'll deal with what the PrEP Act declaration actually says. It's not exactly clear. And at least in my reading, there is some ambiguities. But big picture wise, there's two dates to keep in mind. The end of the public health emergency. We don't know when that is. It's recently been expanded October 1st, 2024. So the PrEP Act authorities and flexibilities that we have been discussing end on one of those dates, whichever is earlier in most cases. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, if an entity is working through an agreement with the federal government to respond to this pandemic, that's a big general category that will take PrEP Act uh, flexibilities and protections will go through October 1st, 2024. If the entity is working through a private commercial channel that otherwise receives PrEP Act protection as a general matter that will last through the end of the public health emergency or October 1st, 2024, whichever is earlier. And then we get to some murky areas that I think HHS still needs to work out, right? For example, what exactly is the scope of working pursuant to an agreement with the federal government? Is an entity working pursuant to a Medicare arrangement? Does that fall into that category? It's not clear. If one reads one of the earlier advisory opinions from the Office of General Counsel, it would cover that situation. It would really benefit the entire community for HHS to clarify that either in a declaration amendment or through an advisory opinion. And there's just certain inconsistencies that logically don't necessarily make sense because as it's currently written, certain types of veterinarians, for example, might enjoy PrEP Act protection going to October 1st, 2024, 
Whereas a fully licensed pharmacist with an active license would have an earlier or potentially have an earlier expiration date on their authorities under the PEP Act. I think folks should continue reaching out to HHS to ask for those type of clarifications and for what I believe are probably technical oversights to clarify something that obviously wouldn't make sense. And I know in a previous iteration of you and I working together, we've had a long conversation going down, you know, a road of, okay, well, if this word meant this word, then maybe it expires on this date. But yeah, the big picture is October, 2024. And then the other big date to know is is the end of the public health emergency. So before we close, I have one final question for you both. What do you think will be the next big thing for pharmacists scope of practice following the pandemic? Well, there's currently two pieces of legislation that's been introduced, and I think they're both significant steps in a much needed and certainly the right direction for public health, for patients. One is the Equitable Community Access to Pharmacist Services Act, which has been introduced in the House on March 24th, 2022. And it would authorize pharmacists to provide care and receive reimbursement under Medicare for many pandemic-related services to our nation's seniors. This would help us avoid many of the scrambles and missteps of the last pandemic or that's still ongoing and position us in a better way to respond. Because remember what I said earlier, there are two big obstacles that we as a nation dealt with last time. First, can pharmacists jump in and can other uh, medical professionals jump in and assist in the pandemic response? And that's a scope of practice issue. But second, even after they can, and this is what Richard mentioned, how do you pay them for it? This would create at least one dependable payment stream for the most vulnerable population as we've seen in this pandemic uh, who are susceptible. And the second is the Pharmacy and Medically Underserved Areas Enhancement Act, which was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives on April 22nd, 2021, and in the Senate on April 26th, 2021. It will allow pharmacists to serve Medicare Part B in underserved areas for services within the pharmacist's state scope of practice, and the pharmacist will be reimbursed at 85% of the physician fee schedule. And this just makes entire sense because in these medically underserved communities, there is already a shortage of physicians. And as we all know here on this podcast, and many of our listeners know, pharmacists are among the most accessible professionals, both in terms of convenience of transportation, 90% of folks in this country live within five miles of a pharmacy, and also the flexibility of schedule for those who can't easily take time off from work, might have to go after hours or on the weekends. This would be a tremendous step in the right direction. Now, even assuming that there is no additional pathway to pay pharmacists for the valuable services that they provide. I think there are also private sector solutions as well. And that's one of the reasons why I've joined Upstream, the company that I currently work for. It recognizes the immense value of pharmacists in the clinical care setting. So our company embeds teams of care coordinators led by a clinical pharmacist in the primary care setting focusing heavily on those cohorts of seniors who suffer from complex and or multiple chronic conditions that drive the vast majority of hospitalizations and other medical spendings in order to manage those chronic care conditions and to ensure better adherence, better access, and just better outcomes for those patients. Even without new legislative pathways that open up Part B billing, there are already pathways available through Incident 2 billing, ACO models, and other private sector solutions that can create value-based payment pathways that pharmacists can practice to the top of the license, which is also good for the primary care physicians because those primary care physicians we work with also give us the feedback that they love working with pharmacists because it allows them to also focus at the top of their license all for the good of the patient. Richard, what do you think is the next big thing for pharmacist scope of practice? Yeah, so I would agree with everything that Will said, but I also think in light of the recent Supreme Court decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization that pharmacists are really going to be at the center of the debate uh, in the states. And 
I think there are a couple of ways that that's going to play out. So first of all, right now, pharmacists are caught between bans on certain medications used for abortion in certain states and the need of certain patients to have access to those medications for certain chronic conditions unrelated to abortion. And that includes cancer, Crohn's disease, arthritis, and pharmacists are in a situation where they're having to evaluate the reason why those medications were prescribed so that they can comply with with state law. I also think we're going to see a revived debate around contraceptive access in the states as well as emergency contraceptives. Uh, There is currently an emergency contraceptive that's been approved for over-the-counter access in the pharmacy since 2013. And I think we're going to continue to see debate over pharmacists' ability to object to providing patients with access to to those emergency contraceptives. You're already seeing it. You've got the OCR guidance that came out a couple of weeks ago that did lay out a little bit of, not a little bit, but a lot of uh, non-discrimination reminders almost to pharmacists and pharmacies. And so I think that is a space definitely to keep an eye on. Will, Richard, thank you so much for joining the show. It was a pleasure having both of you here. Thanks so much, Kayla. It was a pleasure. Kayla, Richard, thank you for the invitation. Let's do it again soon. And thank you to our listeners. Don't forget to subscribe to the Diagnosing Healthcare podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. Also, if you'd like more detail on today's topic, we encourage you to check out the article authored by Richard Hughes and myself coming out soon. Information on the article will be linked in the notes of this podcast. We will also include today's guest email addresses in the show notes. Thank you for listening to Diagnosing Healthcare. For show notes on today's episode, additional episodes, and more insights on trending issues in healthcare, please visit diagnosinghealthcare.com and be sure to subscribe on your preferred platform. The Employment Law This Week and Diagnosing Healthcare podcasts are presented by Epstein, Becker, and Green, PC. All rights are reserved. This audio recording includes information about legal issues and legal developments. Such materials are for informational purposes only and may not reflect the most current legal developments. These informational materials are not intended and should not be taken as legal advice on any particular set of facts or circumstances, and these materials are not a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship has been created by this audio recording. This audio recording may be considered attorney advertising in some jurisdictions under the applicable law and ethical rules. The determination of the need for legal services and the choice of a lawyer are extremely important decisions and should not be based solely upon advertisements or self-proclaimed expertise. No representation is made that the quality of the legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers.